Okay, so this is part three. Um, for me, this is kind of the part where the rubber hits the road. So we're gonna take all the stuff that we've talked about so far, and we're going to kind of put this together into uh, what I think it looks like we know what causes addiction finally. Um, getting away from all the things we were taught in school, getting away from all the, you know, the biases, the things that we believed. I think we actually know. And, and, and I, I kind of got to do a disclaimer here. This is a pretty bold statement for me to say, hey, I think we know what causes addiction. And we could fill this room with scientists and you'd get a bunch of different theories. That's what that first slide was that we showed at the beginning tonight. Um, so anything that's wrong about what I'm about to say, I take full responsibility for, okay? Anything that's right, uh, there are literally hundreds of, of researchers and thousands of studies that are kind of pulled together here. And so I, I, I can't really accept any, any responsibility for the right stuff because I'm just stealing it from other people, but I may have stolen it a little wrong in some ways. So something I'm gonna tell you in the next half hour is going to be wrong. Um, so I gotta own up to that part, okay? But I think this is actually what causes addiction. I think we've got an answer here. And interestingly, you know, it's funny, as I was kind of closing in on this and I was going, whoa, 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 things are starting to fall into place. I was kind of uh, worried about saying anything. And then about the same time, all these different researchers, you know, psychologists, physicians, scientists, started kind of saying the same thing. Everybody, you can just tell they, we finally had enough information that we were all kind of closing in on the same point. It's like a treasure map that we finally got enough detail filled in that people started going, I think the treasure's over in this zone right here. So anyway, um, there's my disclaimer. Um, so we're really going to talk about why do people jettison their tails? Why do they harm themselves? Why do they harm their families? Why do they harm society? Why do they do things that don't make any sense? Um, okay. Now, we talked about this limbic system. There's something that happens in the brain, in this subconscious part of the brain that you don't get to control. Um, and we call it, this part that I'm gonna talk about now is part of the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic basically means automatic, okay? You don't get to decide much as far as this goes. And the autonomic nervous system is what controls you being in chill mode, rest and digest mode, or you being in freak out mode, okay? Fight or flight. Um, now, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to hang out way over here in the green zone almost all the time. That's where we're supposed to live, okay? And then when something bad happens, a, a shark starts chasing us, we're supposed to go over to here. Now, sometimes it's a little threat and we only go to here. You know, let's say my wife says something that makes me feel stupid. That's a threat, right? Because remember, social stuff matters, right? I may go to here if it's just a little threat. You know, I know I'm pretty safe with her. She likes me. It was probably just not a big deal. Um, a shark chewing on my leg is probably gonna put me here, right? Okay, so this, is, this isn't like an on-off switch. This is a, a scale. So you're supposed to head over here when there's a big threat. And then over the next few hours to the next few days, you're supposed to head back over to the other side and get back to chill mode. But we're finding there is a group of people, and I touched on this earlier, we're finding there is a group of people who they get into fight or flight mode and they actually begin to lose that end of the spectrum to some degree, okay? So their best amount of being relaxed in rest and digest mode or feed or breed mode or what doctors call parasympathetic mode, um, the best they can do is maybe here. Now, it's not the same for everybody. There's some people who are horribly affected by this, and their best may be over here. And there are others that barely have it at all, and their best may be here. But we're finding there's a condition that lay people, you know, non-doctors would probably call stuck in fight or flight. Okay? And this may be the holy grail of diagnostic medicine. Um, the more research that's coming down, the more I'm like, oh, and that, oh, and that. Oh my gosh, and that. Um, this is huge. Matter of fact, uh, for those of you who went to those Dine and Discuss lectures at the hospital, we talked about how this affects physical health, the stomach problems that come with it, the pain syndromes that come with it when you're stuck in fight or flight mode. Um, the mental fogging, the panic attacks, the mind churning at night so you can't go to sleep, um, 
maybe even autoimmune disorders fall into this. Anyway, we, that's, a, that's, a, that's a lecture we, we did before. We, we can do that another day if, if anybody wants to talk about that. Um, so then what happens is when things are going well, this may be the best they can get. Okay. Now, there's two, there are two things that happen. One is my base tone is different. And the second one is that a little threat, remember my wife says something that makes me feel stupid? And it would have popped me from here to here. Okay, so I'm already starting way higher, right? And she says something that's a pretty small threat and it pops me to here. But in this group, they have something called potentiation. In other words, a little threat has a big response. You've seen horses like this, right? A little tiny thing happens. The wind blows a bag 50 yards away. And what's that horse doing? Massive freak out, right? So a little threat makes me go way over here. Do you see the difference between the same threat, the exact same thing happened, but on one, I'm here responding to that threat, and the other one, I'm here responding to that threat, okay? Now, I want you to really kind of memorize these if you can. This isn't critical, but if you can memorize, sympathetic is fight or flight. It comes from the Greek word sim, pathos, with emotion, okay? And parasympathetic is against with emotion, which that's kind of redundant, but just parasympathetic means chill, sympathetic means freak, okay? Adrenaline, all that stuff. Okay, so we're going to change those words. We're going to try not to use... So we'll just call it threat mode. People like to call this fight or flight, but I'll show you in a minute why I don't like that phrase for this. And chill mode, okay? Now, there are three stages of threat response mode, and every it looks like every mammal and every bird does this, okay? When the shark starts coming at me, the first thing I'm going to do is social recruiting. And by the way, this is the mid... This is the... the kind of the center part of the brain, the unconscious, you don't get to control it part of the brain, okay? So as this shark's coming at me, I'm out in the middle of the ocean, I'm gonna start social recruiting, screaming for help, trying to get someone to help me. Then my limbic system is gonna look around, my autonomic nervous system is gonna kind of look around and go, there's no one here. This is not an effective strategy. And it's gonna move on to step two, which is flight. And we do flight before fight usually. And it's going to check out flight. So that's going to look like me trying to outswim a shark, right? And when that fails, because it's gonna, I'm going to move on to fight, right? Shark gets a hold of me. I'm punching it in the eye. I'm doing everything I can to protect myself. And then something interesting happens. There's a third stage and we call it shutdown. We can call it collapse. In the military, they call it freeze. This is the soldier that just and there's bullets whizzing around his head and he is frozen, okay? We actually think there's a reason for this, two reasons. It's, it happens in the dorsal vagal complex right back here. Um, and the vagus nerve is what calms you down. It's what gets you into chill mode. But this dorsal vagal complex looks like it actually does some similar stuff, but it does it in response to freak out. So it can look like chill mode, okay? And so, what happens here, now, go watch a nature special next time you get a chance. And you watch real closely. You'll see when the predator is chasing the prey animal, that a lot of times in these, in these montages, the predator will get a hold of the prey animal in a non-fatal grip. And you'll watch the, the rabbit or, or the gazelle just go thunk and go limp. Look at yourself, like, look as a scientist and say, is that a bite that should have paralyzed that animal? And the answer is usually no, right? There's, we think there are two reasons we go into freeze mode. Reason one is it's a pretty good strategy. If a bear's attacking you, what's one of the best things you can do? Play dead, right? It actually sometimes lets the animal, and we see this a lot, um, it lets the animal... Um, the, the, the predator thinks the, that the prey animal's dead and will let their guard down. And then the prey animal will kick back into flight, usually. And you'll see this, or the, they'll look dead and the predator will get in a fight with a hyena and then boom, and it's gone. 
saved its life, right? Because it lulled the predator into a false sense of security. And predators have a prey drive. That's actually the reasoning behind they say if certain types of bears, you know, you're not supposed you're supposed to lay there and, and just not move because it actually, it's like a dog. You run from a dog, a dog's probably going to chase you, right? Um, and bears have that prey drive. Um, and so it, it actually escapes the prey drive. But we think there's a second reason, and this one's really important, that you don't have to live through the experience of being eaten. Many predators will eat you before they kill you. They start the process of eating while you're still alive and you just die somewhere along the way. And we think it's actually to pro protect you from having to live through the experience of being eaten and killed. So this is like nature's like kindness, right? And you don't get to pick which one of these your brain decides to stop in. We can kind of train it out to a degree in soldiers and things, but you don't get a pick, okay? Um, now, um, in animals, we see this all the time, right? Social recruiting, calling for help, social recruiting. That's the safest thing that baby elephant could do, right? You gonna mess with her? But notice that the elephants are social recruiting, the adults. Look at the weight on that elephant's leg. What's it doing? It's leaning on the other elephant that creates safety. We've actually misspoken on this right here. And we've said sometimes women, they don't do fight or flight. They do friend and be ten, uh, tend and befriend. Um, that's not a non-fight or flight thing. That's social recruiting. Okay. Um, and women tend to spend more time in social recruiting than men do. Um, just in general. Um, this is what fight or flight looks like. Flight. Fight. And if you can imagine the look on his eyes, you're going to see flight, right? Now, one thing that's interesting, so especially you, those of you who are healthcare professionals here, I want to point something out. Have you ever had a patient walk into your room with that look on their face? Have you ever had someone walk in that was already social recruiting? When we get stuck in fight or flight, we will pick one of these. Social recruiting, flight, fight, freeze. We'll pick one that's our favorite and we'll hang out there most of the time. And then we'll use the other ones as backups when that one stops working. So people who, whose brains get stuck in social recruiting mode are gonna do things like be really funny. Was Robin Williams funny because he needed to be funny or because he wanted to be funny? It's a form of social recruiting. Remember that girl that was super seductive in high school? Was she doing that because she was healthy? No, that's a form of social recruiting. You know that person that's always telling stories about themselves and, and, and they're the greatest and that's social recruiting. Please love me. My number one drive in my brain is connection. Please find me worthy of connection, right? That's social recruiting. Love me enough to protect me. Powerful way of keeping yourself safe, by the way. Have you ever had someone walk into your office? Or those of you who work in public and retail, you ever had someone walk in with that look in their eyes? They're stuck in flight. Remember that kid in high school, junior high? He's stuck in fight. How about that one? In a mild form, being stuck in freeze looks like the kid you take to Disneyland and you say, hey, how was it? And he goes, it was okay. Remember, freeze is to numb you so you don't have to feel pain, but it also numbs you from feeling good stuff. These are the people who don't feel, and they're often very proud of this. I'm in the same mood every day. The mood is, but I'm in the same mood every day. Um, they don't feel good. They don't feel bad. They've kind of numbed out. And this looks like chill mode, and it is not chill mode. It is the last stage of fight or flight mode, the last stage of threat response mode. And so we often ignore this group when they're the ones that are, kind of screaming the loudest for help, okay? Um, by the way, possums don't play possum. When a possum does this, you cannot wake them up for about 40 minutes to two hours. 
They aren't playing unconscious. If you ever lived in the South, the dogs will throw these things up in the air, they'll bury them, and the possum's gone. And then they wake up, dig themselves out of the ground, and walk off. This is not pretend. Women who pass out, remember that fainting thing that was really popular back about 100 years ago? Um, they actually weren't making it up. The, the dorsal vagal complex, when it really fires, it slows down your heart rate, it slows down your respiratory rate, and if it keeps going, you'll pass out. If it keeps going beyond that, you will actually die. You can die from freeze mode. My brother once shot at a rabbit. We were out deer hunting and he was getting skunk, so was I. Um, and uh, he shot at a rabbit. Just honestly, I think he was so frustrated that he, the deer were skunking him that he was, just wanted to kill something, which uh, he was a kid, so you know, give, give him a little space here. But um, he shot at this rabbit with a 30 out six at about from me to the front row range. Um, again, I'm not proud of this, guys, okay? Um, <laughs> and he pulls up his 30 out six and he shoots this rabbit. He didn't take into account the parallax error between the scope and the barrel. So where'd the bullet go? Under the rabbit's belly, right? And the rabbit fell over dead. Just went thunk. Now we always say died of a heart attack, right? He scared that rabbit to death. A heart attack is a clot that goes into the coronary artery and kills your heart. Did that rabbit throw a clot at the moment he pulled the trigger? No, it's not a heart attack. It's dorsal vagal stimulation. Its heart rate slowed down so much, and its respiratory rate slowed down so much that it died. This can actually kill you. All right, one thing we found is being stuck in fight or flight mode or threat response mode. Fight or flight's just one of the modes here, so I don't like using that term. But being stuck in threat response mode, right there, if, you, if we were to cut your sympathetic, your sympathetic neurons so that you always lived right here for the rest of your life, you'd live a normal length of life. You'd stink at basketball. You'd never run a race again because you couldn't get your heart rate up. But you'd live a normal lifespan. If we cut your parasympathetic ganglia and all you can do is hang out way over here all day, every day, you know how long you'd live? Less than 24 hours. Okay, if I were writing a test, this would be on it. This Because I think this is an important point. I'm, I'm not threatening to test you. I'm just stressing I think this is an important point. You can't survive in fight or flight mode. And your brain knows it. And it will jettison your tail, if necessary, to keep you alive. Okay, that is fatal. So what do we tell addicts to do? White knuckle it. Really? That's like telling that lizard, just try to make your skin really hard so that the teeth don't go through it. Right? That's a nonsense solution. Okay, now interestingly here, there's a lot of things we do in parasympathetic mode too. The one that matters, that matters in a major, major way, is connection. What's your brain's prime directive? Connect to other people. More important than stay alive, right? To the degree that you move over toward freakout zone, you lack the capacity to connect with other people. Even if you have the opportunity You've got this spouse who just adores you. You lack the capacity. If you ever have wondered if you experienced this, have you ever like decided, let's say you were going to a, a party or to church or something, and you're like, I'm such a social dork. I just never... Okay, I am going to talk to people this week. Okay, I'm going, and I'm going to be social, and I'm going to remember everybody's name, and you get up there, and you walk into church or wherever it is, and you're like, yeah, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> That is this. It's inhibition of the ability to connect because you're a little ways over here. Have you ever thought, I'm going to be a better parent? And then you're down watching TV avoiding your kids? Okay. Now, the problem is, when you get over here, your brain picks up on this and says, danger. This cannot happen. You can't be, because you're not going to connect, and you're going to kill yourself, right? 
And so it decides you can't be over here. And what part of your brain senses when there's a problem like that? Limbic system. Problem is the limbic system has a gas pedal. It doesn't have a brake. I got that backward brakes over here. Um, it doesn't have a brake. So its solution to being stuck in fight or flight is give it gas, more fight or flight, which freaks it out because you're not connecting. So what's its solution? Give it even more gas. And we get what's called a positive feedback loop. Positive feedback loops in the world of medicine, in the world of human biology, are uniformly fatal. A mother going into labor is a positive feedback loop. Uterus contracts, tells the brain to release oxytocin, releases more oxytocin, the uterus contracts more. And if she didn't have a baby, if she didn't have an event that ended the uterus contracting, she would die from labor. You can't be in a positive feedback loop. It has to stop, okay? So you see how dangerous this zone is that we're getting into here? Okay. Now, so let's do some math here, okay? We've got the limbic system that thinks every subway is a bear cave, right? So an inappropriate threat response, I'm scared of all men because I had a bad experience with one when I was young. So I'm way over extrapolating. I'm seeing wolves where there are only benign things, okay? Number two, I've got an impaired ability to regulate that, okay? My prefrontal cortex sometimes goes offline a little bit, or maybe even a lot. How's, what's, the, what's that going to add up to? Inappropriate behaviors, right? Whether it's addiction, whether it's acting out in some other way, whether it's a compulsive behavior. I always tell people, if you watch somebody behave, and that behavior doesn't make sense to you, you don't understand human brains. Every human behavior makes sense. If you look at yourself and say, why do I do that? Keep digging. There's a reason. Humans always make sense. Okay? All right, so let's talk about this. This is where we're getting to the nuts and bolts here. Someone who is stuck in this end of the spectrum, up in the flight fight, social recruiting end of the spectrum. Um, a man who, uh, who had previously been the, the head of the American Society of Addiction Medicine taught, I was at a conference where he taught this and it like opened up my eyes, it was huge. I was one of those where you're like, oh my gosh, I get it. He said, there's a group called potentiators. So if this is life, this group makes life super intense. For them, the world comes at them, Dolby, surround sound, cranked up all the way, technicolor, the whole world's just overwhelming. They're potentiating what's coming in, okay? And that's not fun, okay? Now, on the other end of the spectrum, there's a group that does exactly the opposite. They depotentiate. These are the ones who numb out, right? Go to Disneyland and go, it was okay. To them, the world is drab, it's gray, it's muted, and that's intolerable. To the limbic system, both of these are a sign that you're in danger. You're possibly going to die, okay? And so this group is down here, and the world looks very different to people in the different parts of fight or flight response, of threat response, okay? Now, remember that the limbic system's job is to get you back to normal. It's to fix whatever, in, in whatever way you wander out of the center, the limbic system's job is to get you back to what we call homeostasis, the center, okay? And then when you wander over here in another way, its job is to just fix that and nudge you back to center. So we've got two groups of people. One is way over here, the limbic system's picking up on this end of the spectrum. Another one's down here and the limbic system's picking up on the drab, dead end of the spectrum. And it's gonna try to nudge them back. So, its goal is to get you back into chill mode so you can connect, which is more important than staying alive, remember. And so what it's going to do, that little amygdala right there, 
And this is where we come into this theory that I was talking about. Matter of fact, let me, let me talk about the name of this. I, I call this the sympatholytic theory of addiction. Sympatho means the threat response, fight or flight, right? Lytic means to get rid of that. When you lice something, you destroy it. So it's getting, getting people out of fight or flight response. Um, so what that says is the limbic system is going to do anything to push you back here, even if that solution is temporary, and even if that solution has some long-term bad things that are going to come of it, okay? And how does the limbic system get you to do stuff? Does it reason with you? So, the group that's hanging out up here, what they're going to do is be really attracted to what? Things that mute, right? What kinds of drugs, let's just talk about drugs, what kinds of drugs is this group going to be interested in? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. They're going to like alcohol. They're going to like benzodiazepines like Xanax and Valium. They're going to like heroin and marijuana. Tobacco actually can go both ways. Uh, it's a good anxiety drug, by the way. Uh, I'm not encouraging tobacco use, but... Awesome anxiety drug. Um, as a matter of fact, when my patients come in to quit tobacco, I'm like, okay, how are we going to treat your anxiety first before we try to quit tobacco? Because all you're doing then is white knuckling it. That's just not the solution at all. Um, and uh, narcotics like Oxycontin, right? Now, is that going to solve the problem? No. It's what I've heard alcoholics call a failed solution, right? But is the limbic system going to, remember the limbic system is about as smart as a horse. Is the limbic system maybe going to bite on this and go, Ooh. So the same guy that taught me kind of this, this normalization thing, he said, I want to define addiction for you in a little different light. He said, go to an, uh, a frat party or to a fraternity somewhere and sit down and ask each one of the guys, what was it like the first time you tried alcohol? And he goes, and then I want you to go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And I want you to ask them, what was it like the first time you tried alcohol? And he said, you're going to get a real interesting experience here. Because, he said, at the fraternity or the sorority, you're going to hear things all over the map. Well, it made me feel really like liquid courage, like I was brave, I could talk to the girls. You know, it just made me finally, I just felt chill. It just made me nauseated. I felt like I was out of control. I hated it. You're going to get all these different answers. He said, go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and you will hear one answer. Every answer will be a variation on the same answer. They won't say it in the same words, but they'll say the same thing. And the answer will be, it made me feel normal. That is a true addict. If they don't give you that answer, they're not addicted. They're abusing which is a whole different thing. It exists, it's real, but they're not addicted if they say anything that doesn't sound like a synonym of the word normal. So let me propose something to you. You are addicted to things before you try them the first time. The chemical hook theory is wrong. That's why Vietnam didn't pan out. They were alone and they had one drug they had access to, so they all used it. But it wasn't the drug that fixed the problem and felt, made them feel normal for the majority of them. And when they got back home and they had connections and attachments and other options, alcohol or whatever the heck they're, you know, or, or they didn't need it, hopefully, that's when they just stopped on their own. Do you understand how important that concept is for recovery and prevention? The whole world just opened up right there. Okay, so this group is going to be really interested in downers. How about this group? What are they going to be interested in? Yeah, this group is going to feel normal when they take uppers, right? Now, that can look like a lot of things, right? But there's an interesting one. I'm going to take a little side note here, and I want to talk about that one. If you're stuck in shutdown mode, what's adrenaline going to feel like? It's 
It's going to make you feel alive. It's going to make you feel normal again. So we're actually fixing an overactive fight or flight system by activating the fight or flight system. Is that going to be healthy in the long term? What is that going to look like behavior wise, guys? Physical risks, like driving fast, base jumping, right? I feel normal when I'm doing these risky behaviors. Breaking laws. For women in particular, sexual risks can give an adrenaline rush. It's pretty dangerous to be alone with certain people in a vulnerable situation. And have you ever had those, I've had this so many times I can't even count it, where a patient comes in and I'm like, what did you think was, oh my gosh. Like, that's a terrible idea. No, it doesn't mean she deserved to have whatever happened to her happen. You know, the punishment for a bad decision shouldn't be rape. But at the same time, I've sat there so many times when I was on the rape crisis team going, whoa. And before I understood this, it made no sense to me. Now I'm like, oh, oh. Okay. Um, another one, cutting. Does cutting make sense in this, in this setting? You feel something, right? And there's all kinds of, there's other levels. We could go into that on a different day. But how about gambling? Does gambling fit on that? How about, like, this is, again, sexual risks, but you, you know those girls that they date guys, and you're like, you have a really bad track record on picking guys. You, you, you've all met that girl, right? Um, but there's something more to this. Oh, by the way, the American Psychiatric Association has this big, thick book that as doctors, we just call it nonsense. They call it the DSM-5. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's probably the thickest work of fiction in the entire <laughs> medical world. Um, it has one diagnosis in it, okay? They say it has about 157, but if you're a doctor, it has one diagnosis. And the reason is the DSM-5 is a list of a bunch of symptoms in a, in a doctor's mind. Those don't count as diagnoses. Imagine that you're, you went to your pulmonologist and you said, or let's say you went to your primary care doc and you walk in and you say, I've got a fever and I've got a cough and I can't breathe and my chest hurts right here and I'm coughing up this nasty stuff that tastes terrible and the doctor does an x-ray on you. And at, he walks back in and he says, yeah, man, you've got this huge white spot on your x-ray right here. Your oxygen level's dropping. You've got a fever. You know what you've got? Cough. <laughs> and cough is dangerous. And cough can kill you. Stop coughing. And then he gets up and walks out of the room. Are you going back to that doctor? Why? Cough is not a diagnosis. Cough is a symptom, right? So your next question is, do I have pneumonia? Do I have tuberculosis? Why am I coughing, right? Acid reflux, there's a lot of reasons for cough. Asthma, do you treat asthma the same way you treat tuberculosis? Is it really important that this doctor actually gives you a diagnosis rather than a symptom? So what, what happens when we go in for behavioral health? You go into the doctor and the doctor says, I've got bad news, you have depression. That's a symptom. Why do I have depression, right? Everything in the DSM-4 is a list of symptoms except one, PTSD. That's a diagnosis. Trauma caused it. You see the cause in it? So the DSM-5, I always say DSM-4 because that's what I grew up on. But anyway, DSM-5, I think it's dumb. Um, now, I want to talk about something else. And this one really matters. There are two things that are universal drugs. Okay, now when I am in fight or flight mode and I drink alcohol, does that actually put me back into chill mode, drinking the alcohol? No, it makes me feel like I'm in chill mode. It does not put me in chill mode. But if I put food in my gut, something really interesting happened. Do you remember that experiment? Um, 
where, I don't know if you ever did this, we did this in school, where they take a pencil and they have you stick it in your mouth as far back as you can like this and leave it there for about five, 10 minutes. And they have you rate your mood before you stuck the pencil in your mouth and rate your mood after you stuck the pencil in your mouth. And actually what you'll find is your mood improved, even though that was kind of painful, um, your mood improves. Do you know why? It's a retrograde feedback. If you act happy, you become happy. And that mimics the muscles of smiling. There is a retrograde feedback that's going on when we eat. When you stick food in your belly, the vagus nerve begins to fire. It increases the blood flow to your gut and your pelvis. And do you know what the vagus nerve is? It's the parasympathetic, main parasympathetic nerve of the body. In other words, when you eat, you chill. You go parasympathetic. Food is the drug that actually delivers on its promise. Heroin does not, it's a false solution. Food is. It delivers, it puts you in chill mode. How many of you have gotten home at night and you stayed on your diet all day long and about six o'clock, you're eating and you're not hungry at all? Have you done that? And you're just mowing. That's your brain trying to get you into parasympathetic mode so you can go to bed. Make sense? Is it feel a little compulsive? Sex does the same thing. In, in medical school, one of the basic things you learn in physiology class is arousal is parasympathetic. Remember, parasympathetic means chill. Orgasm is sympathetic, which is the fight or flight. So in order to become sexually aroused, you have to be in chill mode. Do you see how sexual behaviors for a little while can route us right back to where we need to be? Do you see where the, mid, the midbrain might compel us in that direction? And remember, that's one of its jobs in the first place, is to compel you to eat so you don't die, compel you to reproduce so your genes pass on. So the very system that controls those behaviors now has motivation to try to save your life, and one of its tools happens to be something that actually, remember I said it has a, it has a gas pedal, but it doesn't have a brake? Well, if it puts the gas pedal on in the world of food or the world of sex, you're going into parasympathetic mode. Now, I'm going to take a little aside here. I think, this, uh, I'm going to go stand in the opinion corner here. This could be wrong. Um, I think this is why families that eat together stay together. I think eating forces us into parasympathetic tone. And we sit down and we talk as a family about what's going on and our brain goes, Oh, I'm connecting. Remember you went to church and you couldn't connect? But if you ate all the way through church, you actually might. <laughs> you notice how much humans tie food with social? I think that's why families that eat together do so well when we study them. Like crazy well. Like you're like, it's a freaking meal. How great can it be? But I think that's what it is. I think it's pushing you into parasympathetic mode. Okay, I'll quit belaboring that point. This is what I think causes addiction. Now, we've been told a lot of stories about what causes addiction. I wanna make a few points. Most people who try, so there's, we've been told this story, and I don't agree with this story, I call this the flat world theory of addiction. Most people who, that we say, stage one is, is experimentation. These are boys smoking out behind the barn, right? Stage two is abuse. That's that. Stage three is dependence, right? That is, if you take me off it, I'm going to have a response. That's the little old lady who had hip surgery three weeks ago. She's dependent, okay? And stage four, if you're going to keep going, you're going to end up addicted. Um, that's, we're not showing that anywhere. That's not right. That's clearly not right. Vietnam's proven that. Everything we've ever experienced has proven that. Every counselor in this room will go, mm, mm, mm. that's not what I've, I've watched. 
What happens is it actually goes the opposite direction. You're already addicted to this thing because you've got a way that some things are gonna fix you're stuck in fight or flight. You don't know how much you're stuck in fight or flight because we stink at assessing that. And you don't know what things fix it, right? And so what happens is you try it and it's the one, the key just fits your lock. Then what will happen is downstream from that, you will find yourself abusing and you'll find yourself becoming dependent. Getting dependent doesn't cause addiction probably for most people, it's the other way around. Getting addicted causes dependence. You with me? The chart goes the opposite direction. Now, this gun may or may not have bullets in it. Do you want your daughter finding out? Be better if she didn't know, right? So I really do believe in the principle of maybe don't find out the things you're addicted to if you can help it. Some things you can't avoid. How many people have managed to avoid food so far in life? But if you possibly can stay away from meth, might be nice not to find out if that gun's loaded, right? All right, so I want you to look closely. Here's the test at the end of this section. You guys uh, memorize the picture. I'm gonna ask you a question about it. Did you spot the horse? Why am I asking such a stupid question? Because in the world of addiction, we have looked at this picture over and over and gone, man, that guy ends up in the dirt all the time. And somehow we have missed the horse, the whole horse. That's an incredible feat. That is as dumb as looking at an elephant and as soon as the thing turns sideways, we go, oh, it disappeared, right? You have to be really sophisticated to be this stupid. Where's the real problem here? If you were gonna fix the problem, the problem is this cowboy's not having fun, okay? This is not, I mean, this is his job, so he's gonna do it, but how do you fix this problem? Where is the issue? Yeah. Right there, right? If you let go of that strap, things are gonna improve drastically. In addiction. The midbrain, the, 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 the limbic part of the brain, not just the midbrain, but the limbic system of the brain is the horse. What's the strap? What's the strap? What causes the behavior in the horse? Yeah, fear. Usually a fear of disconnection. How do we treat addicts, by the way? Addiction is caused by fear, usually a social threat, a fear of disconnection from some learned thing that happened earlier in life. And how do we fix it? With a good, healthy dose of fear, right? If Skinner boxes cause people or cause rats to get addicted, what do we do when we find someone who's addicted? We literally stick them in a Skinner box that's human sized. Is that the most insane thing you've ever heard? That's like your doctor going, you've got pneumonia, I'm gonna inject bacteria into your lung. That'll fix you. That is nonsense. And the guy who started it was insane. And we follow him. We are his disciples. We adore this man. Even those of us who've never heard his name worship him. How many police officers have died giving their lives for a guy, and I'm gonna, this is gonna sound extreme, who had the same motivations and the same reasons for doing things as Adolf Hitler? Why did Hitler do what he did? Power, bigotry. In America, we have a man who has probably not killed as many people as Adolf Hitler. I, I don't know, the war on drugs has been devastating, and we can't even count the lives. 
but I'll bet he's destroyed as many families as Adolf Hitler. Germany doesn't even allow you to name a child Adolf. They have learned. America, we follow this man in our churches. We teach it over the pulpit, in our schools, and officers give their lives nobly fighting for a man that I think of as America's Hitler.